You're listening to the Bloomberg Balance of Power podcast. Catch us live weekdays at noon Eastern on Apple CarPlay and Android Auto with the Bloomberg Business app. Listen on demand wherever you get your podcasts or watch us live on YouTube. Welcome to the Friday edition of Bloomberg Sound On. I have news before we get to the news. This is the last edition of Sound On as you know it, as I know it. When we come back on Monday, we'll be at an earlier time, 12 noon Washington time. And it's going to work a little bit differently here. And by that, I mean in a better way. We'll have our first hour on the radio as it is now and on YouTube. And our second hour will be carried when Kaylee Lines joins us for hour two. will be carried on Bloomberg TV. And I hope that you'll be with us for the process. Our signature panel will be here, Rick Davis and Jeannie Shanzano. And, you know, we like to do things big. We're going to start this in New Hampshire on Monday. Yes, we're all getting on planes this weekend to bring you the very latest from the first in the nation primary, which could be a last stand for Nikki Haley. It could be the galvanizing moment for Donald Trump. It could be embarrassing for Ron DeSantis. We'll go through it together. And I have news here. We've been talking polls all week, but this is interesting and not the headline that I thought we'd see today. Senator Tim Scott now set to endorse Donald Trump just days out from the primary, a former candidate and a man who is widely admired throughout the Republican Party. Getting involved on this level is pretty incredible. This is where we start our conversation with Tim O'Brien, Bloomberg Opinion columnist, and of course, as I mentioned, the man who wrote the book on Donald Trump. Trump Nation, the art of being the Donald is with us in studio. It's always a pleasure to have you in Washington. It's I'm always a treat, Sorry Joe. for the snow. Uh, <laughs> Washington the, snow is not bad snow. Well, I grew, actually, I grew up in Chicago. It's sweepable, right? It's sweepable. Today, no one's having a heart attack. Yeah, it always cracks me up how it shuts the city down. They canceled school last yeah. night before a flake. Yeah, it's but come we on, people. Do a whole show on it. All right. That. Donald Trump would still fly in and go back home and sleep in his own bed based on what we've seen. I'm just, are, I want to talk to you about the apparent inevitability <sighs> storyline here. But first of all, are you surprised to hear about Tim Scott? I'm not. I mean, I think that, you know, I think that. Anybody who sees them as, sees themselves mm -hmm. as a Republican in Donald Trump's Republican Party is inevitably going to come in yeah. behind him. I think I think it's craven hmm. because um, it's we're in primary season, yeah. and so we haven't really road tested these ideas with a general electorate. Mm -hmm. And I think it was ordained that he was going to do well in this primary because the most motivated. Um, part of the Republican base comes out in the primaries, and that's right now the MAGA base. Yes. You'd think maybe he'd do this on the eve of South Carolina, which is still weeks away. But he's jumping in before New Hampshire, clearly an attempt to winnow the field or maybe eliminate the field. Is that and and I also think to get, you know, a possible position in a Trump okay. administration, yeah. which well. is, you know, and I think, um, you know, I think one of the problems with Nikki Haley's candidacy is that she hasn't been um, sharply defining herself mm -hmm. apart from Trump. Mm -hmm. um, She's watching people like Chris Christie, who fell by the wayside, who did. So there's a political calculation. Is she in keeping here. the door open for something, or just wants to be available <laughs> for the MAGA base if Donald Trump is not? I can't. I, I, you know, that was Ron DeSantis's strategy, yes. and that has failed. How about it? And and there is only one Donald Trump for the MAGA base, mm -hmm. and and I don't think Ron DeSantis was was Trump light. I think he was a bad candidate. He, he lacks Trump's charisma. He lacks the real emotional bond Trump has yeah. with his voters. Um, you can't and fake I don't, that. You can't fake that. And, and, and it's a real, it's, it's one of Trump's great political strengths and advantages is that he has an authentic emotional bond with his core supporters. Well, so knowing him to the extent that you do, are we really going through this all over again? Have you committed yourself to another Trump-Biden race? Well, yeah, I think it's going to, it's absolutely going to be Donald Trump and Joe Biden. I think people that thought Joe Biden was going to step aside uh -huh. misunderstand how long he's wanted that job. People who thought Donald Trump was going to step aside misunderstood how long he's wanted to be perpetually in the public spotlight. And he's got legal issues hanging over his head that his presidency would solve. Uh -huh. Joe Biden's conventional wisdom until now was that's the one guy we want because we know we can beat him. We were afraid more of a Nikki Haley or maybe a Ron DeSantis uh, becoming the nominee. Uh, is that a foolish view based particularly on some of the swing state polling that Bloomberg has done? Um, I think that I, I, I think it's true that Trump is the most ideal candidate yeah? for Joe Biden to run against. You, th you think he can beat him again? 
Um, I think it's going to be on a razor's edge. Yeah. Um, I think that um, uh, I think he would have had more trouble with Nikki Haley than he will have with Donald Trump. Are you I think, counting her out then? This is yeah. I, I think she's. I think she's. Hampshire. She's probably done. I think both wow. she and Ron DeSantis are done by South Carolina. Wow. Yeah. I could be. I could end up being wrong. Mm-hmm. Uh, I think she'll come in second in New Hampshire. The polls are suggesting she's eight points behind. It might be more than that. Mm-hmm. DeSantis will be nowhere in New Hampshire. And if she loses in South Carolina, which is her home state, she was the governor of South Carolina, yeah. I don't see how, you know, Michigan follows, and then you have Super Tuesday. And then we're done. But we don't really, may yeah. not even get to Super Tuesday. And obviously it's the, the same is true of Biden with the Democrats. It's, it's, you know, he's going to be the nominee. So this is be Donald Trump's, well, third, technically, presidential campaign. What will an emboldened post-January 6th emboldened Trump look like this time around? As a candidate or as president? As a candidate. <clears throat> as a candidate, I think he'll do what he's continued to do, which is, um, you know, that both the entrance and the exit polls in Iowa, two of the, the top responses for why Trump appealed to his voters were he fights for us and he shares our values. And I think when when his supporters say he fights for us, he is fighting for he he identifies as being a victim. Mm -hmm. He despite the fact that he's a wealthy white male who's had every advantage in life. uh, (laughs) The idea that that he's a victim (laughs) is comically (laughs) absurd. Uh, But but he understands and he's played that card repeatedly. I feel your pain. Sure. The institutions are out to get you. They're out to get me. They're coming at me in a different way. A but billionaire. I, yeah. In that case. Yeah. Uh, and a celebrity mm-hmm. and a president. He uh-huh. has so many disadvantages. Wealth, celebrity, uh, uh, white American. <laughs> like I just, it's the things he's had to struggle with are extraordinary. Um, bone spurs. Right. But <laughs> bone spurs. Yeah. But, uh, but, you know, he has said that you know, there's no traction of these legal charges against him. It is the institutions coming at him mm-hmm. in the same way they've come after you, dear voters. Mm-hmm. Therefore, I might be a dictator for a day. It'll only yeah. be a day. Right. I might try to run again after this administration. <laughs> Who knows? I know that legally I'm not allowed to, but I might do it anyway. Because you need a dictator to take care of you. <laughs> and, 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 you know, this has real traction with his voters. <laughs> a lot of people think they do, apparently. Yeah. Uh, and, and would go through 30 degree below zero weather to caucus for him after dinner in Iowa. Yes. Uh, We're watching this happen in real time. How far out of the lines, though, could he be playing as a candidate this time? Because he knows that he's the exception to every rule. He is. But also, you know, one of the things he's doing now that he didn't do in 2016 Mm -hmm. when he first came on the seen in a seismic way is he has professionalized his campaign operation. Right. You know, he had, I think, over a thousand precinct captains yeah. on the ground in Iowa. He wasn't there. He didn't need to be there. Uh, the, the victory speech he gave in Iowa was for Donald Trump, about as diplomatic as you get. It lasted about 10 seconds, but you got some of that. Speech. Like, yes. yes, you know, and good job, Nikki, and good job, Ron, mm-hmm. and my mom and dad are looking at me from heaven and all that stuff. <laughs> and as, as opposed to you know, I'm going to rip your your guts out yeah. and hang you in the public square, which is generally where he resides. It was about 24 hours before the racial slurs started, <laughs> started against rolling. Nikki Haley on, social, yes. on uh, Truth Social. Yeah. The missives on Truth Social Are would suggest that we have not matured, maybe gotten worse when it comes to that. It works for him. Yeah. It's not just, I mean, we have to really understand Donald Trump through the prism of the people who support him, not just Donald Trump himself. And and what he has done is peeled back this Band-Aid on ideas we have in the U.S. about how much progress we've made mm-hmm. around racial justice or economic uh, equity, that, that, you know, there's still a lot of that boiling over with the electorate itself. Yeah. Will he sink a border deal if one comes along? You know, he's on the phone, apparently, with the Speaker of the House on the regular. Uh, the con- this Congress and this Republican Congress has no interest in getting a border deal done because they want to hang the immigration albatross around so this is all a charade Biden's neck. There are, you know, Lindsey Graham is saying, there's a number of, of Republicans who are saying this is the best border deal they're going to get, even yes. if Trump comes in the White House. That's right. It should get done, and yet they're not doing it. those who have been there are saying this. Yeah. Those with experience. Yeah. So if they cared about public policy and taking care of the border and our border states mm-hmm. that are dealing with, with uh, 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 an out-of-control migration problem, they would get this deal done. Mm-hmm. And they're not getting it done to score political points. It doesn't make sense from a public policy standpoint. Wow. It doesn't make sense uh, from a national standpoint. Uh, but it does make sense from scoring points. And I think the Biden administration will have to point out to voters that the reason immigration is now 
in chaos from a policy standpoint and from an enforcement standpoint along the border is because this Congress doesn't want to pass the legislation that would address it. That's going to be a tough sell because they hold up HR2 and then the thing goes around again. Um, you asked me as a candidate or as a president. Now, Donald Trump as a president, let's see, he, he closes the deal. Then, then we really drain the swamp. We, we, we put in the action plan to replace the bureaucracy with something we've never seen before. Right. I think there's two things. There. He will not drain the swamp because he, he lives in the swamp. And he said he was going to drain it last time, and he just brought in bigger alligators. Okay. So he has no interest in sort of ending the money wheel in, mm. in, in Washington. Um, I do think he has an interest in dismantling the federal government. Uh, the agencies that exist as part of the executive branch. And I think in an ideal world, we would have a very healthy public debate about where expertise should reside around policymaking. Does it, should it belong in agencies? Should it belong in, mm -hmm. in uh, the Congress or in the Supreme Court? And then how do we use that effectively to drive policy? That's not the conversation he wants to have. He just wants to get rid of most agencies but keep the Defense Department and the Justice Department so he can weaponize both against his critics. Wow. Uh, you ready to cover that? Uh, we have to cover that. It's a, it's a, it's a, it, this is a seismic moment in American history. This isn't just another political race. This is really testing how we think about American democracy and the rule of law and the Constitution. And I think the more we cover it as a horse race and the less we look at, at foundationally who we are as a country, I don't think we serve our listeners and readers well. Will you stay in touch with us through the year on this program? If you'll stay in touch with me, I'm, because I, mean, I always like talking this to is you. A, this is really important. Um, I don't know if I'm allowed to ask you this. What's it like to be sued by Donald Trump? Oh, you can ask me, and I'll give you an answer that drives my wife, who's a lawyer, nuts, <laughs> okay. is that I actually enjoyed the process because we deposed him, and we got access to his business records and bank records wow. and through the litigation, and the work stood up. The court upheld the integrity of the work. He lost the case. Um, Was your phone ringing at night, though? People were driving by the house. What uh, you know, there's always a been. price of covering Donald Trump yeah. where the people who support him right. come after you personally. But say la vie. Tim O'Brien, great to see you. Thank Thanks you, for Joe. Coming. Good uh, to see we're you. off to New Hampshire tomorrow, and we'll talk to you when we get back. All right. uh, he runs the Bloomberg Opinion Operation here, uh, which you can always find on the terminal and at Bloomberg.com. Tim O'Brien, the author of the book Trump Nation, The Art of Being the Donald, as we get things started here, going into a weekend that might play in a very big way for Donald Trump. Let's assemble the panel. Rick Davis and Jeannie Shanzano are here. Bloomberg Politics contributors. Rick, you've spent more time in New Hampshire uh, than most Republican strategists. How are you feeling on this weekend before the primary? You know, I, I'm actually surprised there's not more sort of cliffhanging uh, indecision by people. The polls are all coming in really consistent. And, you know, Polling is 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 has got a rich history in New Hampshire. There's an enormous amount of data available from just really fantastic organizations that are used to doing it, and it all usually turns out to be a little bit wrong. So um, today huh. we wake up and Donald Trump's winning this thing. He's got over fifty percent in a few of these uh, really credible surveys, uh, and 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 that's going to be really hard to overcome for Nikki Haley. Uh, for whatever reason, Donald Trump benefited from his time in Iowa and she didn't. Uh, she's kind of stalled out in these polls with what she had going into Iowa. And maybe it was Vivek Ramaswamy's, Vivek's Ramaswamy's endorsement and his votes. But the bottom line is um, she's got to be uh, really coming from behind to make this work. Uh, and tons of good questions out there about what level the independents are going to show up, the un unaffiliated. Uh, they always play an important role. Uh, in New Hampshire primary politics, and, and that's probably the biggest question right now. Jeannie, Nikki Haley uh, held a town hall on CNN last night. She was asked about some of the, the, the insults that she's been getting from Donald Trump recently. She said, do you really want two 80-year-olds running for president uh, when we have a country and a world on fire? But she said, I will continue to focus on things people want to talk about and not get into name-calling. Is that the right tone here on the eve of the primary? It's not working for her. And the polls tell the story. And I'm glad she was out on CNN. But quite frankly, people in New Hampshire report she hasn't been out on their airways enough. She needs a Hail Mary at this point. She doesn't seem like she is jumping at one. She's turned down some interviews. She's been, uh, mm -hmm. you know, out on the stump, but it's been in northern New Hampshire and other places. So I'm not sure that her argument she's going to stay above the fray is working for her. Yeah. And in fact, if you believe the polls, they're saying it's not. 
We're going to find out together. Rick and Jeannie are going with us. We're headed to New Hampshire this weekend. We're going to pick up on this news of an endorsement, though, as we get the panel's reaction to Tim Scott making it official, coming in behind Donald Trump just before New Hampshire. It's the fastest show in politics from snowy Washington. I'm Joe Matthew. This is Bloomberg. You're listening to the Bloomberg Balance of Power podcast. Catch us live weekdays at noon Eastern on Apple CarPlay and Android Auto with the Bloomberg Business app. You can also listen live on Amazon Alexa from our flagship New York station. Just say, Alexa, play Bloomberg 1130. Piece of news from the White House. In my constant effort to say something positive on this broadcast, the government is not going to shut down today. I say that officially Just got word from the White House the president has signed the stopgap government funding bill that Congress ushered through yesterday. So there we go. We head into this weekend uh, without a shutdown on our hands. The question is what happens in March because we've got another ladder here. This would mean an expiration March 1st and on March 8th. And if you think about what's going to happen in that period of time between Super Tuesday, the potential start, the scheduled start of Donald Trump's trial – And President Biden's State of the Union. That should be interesting. None of these things happen in a vacuum, right? Keep that in mind. Speaking of which, big news on the campaign trail as we prepare to go to New Hampshire. This is the one Nikki Haley was, gosh, she must have been hoping for. Everybody was. To get the endorsement of Senator Tim Scott. It's going to Donald Trump. And this is an important bit of reporting on behalf of Bloomberg. He will endorse Donald Trump this evening at a rally in Concord, New Hampshire, according to those familiar speaking on condition of anonymity. Let's reassemble the panel. Rick Davis and Jeannie Shanzano, Bloomberg Politics contributors. Uh, This is one that actually could make a difference uh, in terms of helping Donald Trump, Jeannie. No? It could. I mean, it it is her home state. He is senator uh, in large part because of her. They did mix it up a bit in the debates, of course. But the idea that he would endorse now, um, it really, I think, shows you and is a reflection of how much the Republican establishment and not just the MAGA wing of the party is owned by Mm -hmm. Donald Trump. You know, Tim Scott follows Marco Rubio. You know, just the sheer number of endorsements that Donald Trump has out of Congress is a reflection of his strength and his ownership of the party, making it all that much more tougher for Nikki Haley to have any kind of surprise win in New Hampshire. It could happen, but it is becoming increasingly less likely as the hours go by. What do you make of the timing here, Rick? Not only is the call coming from inside the House, This endorsement from South Carolina that he could have waited a couple weeks, you know, to have an impact in his own state doing this on the eve of New Hampshire. Does this feel like a party that wants to get this over with? Yeah, I'm sure the 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 Trump people pressed him to do it while they are in the the pre New Hampshire balloting. Look, I mean, it's not like he's going to help Donald Trump with conservatives, which is his base and especially evangelicals. Because Trump's already getting a lion's share of those votes. There's nothing really going to be beneficial to him. But he could have been a gateway to those voters looking and saying, well, if Tim Scott's going to go for Nikki Haley, then we're comfortable doing that, too. So so the yeah. predicate now isn't going to get set. And Nikki, although she's doing extremely well with independence in New Hampshire, she, and she failed in really crossover uh, voting and getting conservatives in Iowa, and she needs those conservatives in New Hampshire to compete with Donald Trump, and she's just not getting him. So this is a huge disappointment, I'm sure, for Nikki Haley and her campaign, because they, I think, saw Tim Scott as that permission structure for Republicans who are conservative or evangelical to be willing to support her. And now she's not going to get it. You you can frame that, Rick, uh, about how sought after that was. Maybe I should ask that in a different way. How popular he is inside the party. He has the respect of his colleagues. Yes. I mean, both on Capitol Hill with his fellow senators, you know, so within the institution of the Senate, he's considered a very solid, very thoughtful um, uh, member. Uh, But at home, he's the hometown kid. He's the guy from the other side of the tracks who made good. His his personal story is immensely compelling to South Carolinian voters. And even though he didn't he wasn't successful 
conveying that to a broader audience of Republicans around the country. Um, he 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 was able to have an impact in a lot of circles um, in 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 this campaign. And and so, yeah, I mean, he's he's kind of the gold standard of Republicans, especially in the South right now, when you have the swirl of discussions around slavery and and racism that have sort of populated this last couple of days on the campaign trail. Um, you know, mm. he's he is the safest harbor you're going to find politically. Jeannie, are you feeling like this is over now that it's a party that wants to pull the ripcord and just make Donald Trump the nominee? Well, historically, New Hampshire has delivered surprises. So that is always something <laughs> I keep in the back of my mind. But if and Rick knows that better than anybody. But if you trust the polls, which I know a lot of people don't, I do they would have to be wildly off for her to win. Could she come in close? I, I think that's possible. But even if she does, she's going to do it on the backs of independents, Democrats. And that is going to be something that Donald Trump is just chomping at the bit to use. Um, you know, she has a big problem now. She has been defined, oddly, as Chris Christie and Asa Hutchinson and other never Trumpers have left the race. She has become really the poster child of the never Trumpers, which is, you know, not a place she wants to be if she hopes to win the Republican primary at this point. And of course, it's stunning because this is Nikki Haley. Let's not forget, she had the endorsements of Mitt Romney and Sarah Palin to become governor. She was part of that Tea Party <laughs> movement. But now she is yeah. nothing of the sort. She is, you know, Chris Christie you know, of the female variety. And, you know, it's not a fair way she's been characterized. But, you know, going back to how Donald Trump now wants to make her Hillary Clinton, this is what she has become. They had to fight that hard early. Huh. And her campaign has stumbled in doing that. You just said a lot there. That's fascinating, Jeannie. Rick, what do you think about the fact that Nikki Haley was rebranded to such an extent from others. Is that the biggest failure of this campaign? Well, I think it's the biggest failure of Nikki Haley's campaign. Um, you know, yeah. uh, Jeannie's right. I mean, she is a conservative's conservative in South Carolina. She got elected ahead of the current governor, who's considered a scion of conservatism in South Carolina. I mean, you know, her, her credentials as a conservative are impeccable. Uh, but when you go through a campaign, you get redefined. And when you run mm -hmm. against Donald Trump, He's the one who gets to define you. Remember, he's got the megaphone, right? He's got 100% name ID. They've all had to try to earn yeah. it. In the course of doing that, he's been able to define Ron DeSantis very effectively long before Ron DeSantis even actually got into the race. And with Nikki Haley turning his sights on her around the time of the Iowa caucuses, uh, the barrage has been very significant, uh, both in advertising and, of course, in his own comments that get picked up all over the world. So, yeah, she, I, it's very hard to maintain your ideological clarity in a campaign against Donald Trump, who actually has no ideological clarity. He benefits from being whatever he wants to be any given day. And so it's very hard Something. to pin him down. So yeah, I, I, as I said, you know, she's been identified as someone the, the independents want because it's not Donald Trump. She's, she's, she has not cut into that conservative base of people who want an option to Trump but want to be comfortable that um, they have someone who will pursue his policies without all the chaos. That was her campaign, and it just hasn't stuck. Mm -hmm. Jeannie, you mentioned the polls. Uh, we've got a, now a daily tracking poll leading up to the primary that's being done by uh, Suffolk University, David Paleologos, who was on with us a couple of days ago working with the Boston Globe, uh, Trump 52 Haley, 35. He's got a 17-point lead here. It really doesn't matter the rest of the field. Ron DeSantis is all the way down at six. By the way, Trump in this poll, up two since the last one. Haley is down one. If we're gauging momentum and direction, at least, that's where we stand. And I'll keep tabs on that for you throughout the weekend. And leading into Monday, we'll have... Mr. Paleologos with us uh, from Manchester next week to set the baseline on where we are when voting begins. You're listening to the Bloomberg Balance of Power podcast. 
Catch us live weekdays at noon Eastern on Apple CarPlay and Android Auto with the Bloomberg Business app. Listen on demand wherever you get your podcasts or watch us live on YouTube. It's like a snow globe up here in the Bloomberg Bureau in D.C. It's actually beautiful as long as you don't have to go outside, I guess. Yeah, it it feels very cozy on the inside. And I take some personal solace in knowing that the outside isn't as cold as it was the last time I saw snow, which was in Iowa. No, it's actually not that cold out. But this is the reason why the government's open, basically. Right. They felt the need to get out of town before the snow started. It turned out to be a real snowstorm, so God bless it. The the schools are closed, (laughs) but the government is open. We'll we'll go with that. Um, Did they get that markup going, the Ways and Means? These are like the only people who had to go to work in the Capitol today at 9 a.m. Thank you very much. Richie Neal had his snow boots ready. And it passed out of the committee. I guess we'll see what the fate is now of this tax deal. Because a lot of people were pushing for changes that they didn't necessarily get. Well, that's true. Um, I suspect that uh, Bharat Ramamurthy has uh, some thoughts on that. An expanded child tax credit was a huge priority for the administration while he was working for Joe Biden. Yeah, absolutely. And theoretically, it could be growth positive Mm -hmm. if it were to come through at what is a pretty critical moment for a Biden administration that is still struggling with getting credit for the strength of the economy that we're still seeing. That's true. And it would come in exchange for more uh, business-friendly taxes. Uh, everything is a bargain, of course, in Washington. And let's bring in Bharat Ramamurthy now, a senior advisor for economic strategy at the American Economic Liberties Project, of course, former deputy director of National Economic Council, as you probably remember seeing and hearing uh, in his days at the White House. Bharat, welcome back. It's good to see you. Is that a fair trade? I was going to start on something else. But while we're talking about this, this was a big deal. This goes back to Build Back Better to trade an expanded child tax credit for more business-friendly, more corporate taxes, does that end up being a wash in a way that's good for the country? I guess I would say this. I think it's a travesty that in the wealthiest planet on Earth, you have millions of children growing up in poverty, and I think any step we take towards reducing the number of children in poverty is a step worth taking. And this deal, as you noted, expands the child tax credit. It will lift hundreds of thousands of children out of poverty. And I think that that makes it worthwhile. I think the corporate elements of it are, frankly, a little disappointing and and unnecessary. For example, one portion of it is a set of retroactive tax cuts for the 2023 tax year. The entire theory behind these corporate tax cuts is that they're intended to create an incentive for more investment. It's hard to go back in time and create an incentive in 2023 with this change. That's just a pure giveaway. But if it's the price that we have to pay to lift more children out of poverty, I think it's a, a small price that's worth paying. I wonder about your thoughts on the order this is being done, though. If we could potentially see a tax deal on the revenue side passed before we actually get a budget for the fiscal year that started months ago on the spending side of the ledger. Yeah, I think you always see this kind of disjunction between some of the revenue measures moving at a different pace than than the spending side. Uh, to, To go to your point about about spending, If you all remember when we had the debt ceiling standoff several months ago, the the outcome of that was that the president uh, and the House Republicans agreed on a deal where they set a top line for spending in the coming fiscal year. And the only thing that had to happen after that was that House Republicans had to go back and actually write individual spending bills to match that top line. Uh, Instead, what's happened is that there's been repeated uh, attempts to renegotiate the deal that was struck to avoid the debt ceiling crisis. And that's what's brought us to this position where you have these repeated continuing resolutions. I think it's unfortunate. I think at the end of the day, everyone benefits from having individual appropriations bills where you decide to, to tweak spending levels and rather than just carrying forward the levels that uh, that existed the previous year. But really, the onus is on House Republicans now to honor the deal that they cut several months ago. But you see the votes in the House yesterday, uh, Barada says a lot. I mean, Mike Johnson's leadership team voted no. The chairs of eight committees voted no. And it wasn't just MAGA time. Brian Stile, the chair of the admin committee, is on this list. The budget chair is on this list. What would be your view if you were working for the president at this point to say, you know, there is no budget coming, Mr. President. This is CRs the rest of the year, right? Well, look, the, the, the positive news of, from, from that, from the administration's perspective, is that the last uh, fiscal year was a year in which Democrats controlled the House and Senate and the White House, and they set spending levels at a a level that they liked. And so if we continue uh, with continuing resolutions, you're uh, uh, basically extending uh, spending levels that Democrats work together to set. 
And so uh, I think the leverage here is ultimately with the Democrats to wait this out. I think the president has been clear he wants a deal here. He wants to honor the deal that he's cut. But if Republicans insist on, on one CR after another, at the end of the day, all they're doing is enshrining levels that Democrats set in the first place. So as we have this talk about spending, about potentially keeping it at the same or looking for more cuts, if you're some uh, members of the Republican Party, at least in the House, it's against a backdrop, Barat, of what has been consistently a strong economy and recent data we've gotten this week suggests perhaps is even more so than we would be expecting at this point in the cycle, considering how hard, uh, far the Fed has hiked rates. You look at the UMish consumer sentiment numbers, they've improved, according to the latest reading, while inflation expectations have gone down. Have we turned a corner here? Are we actually going to see start this start showing up, not just in the economic data, but actually in sentiment when voters think about the president and his job on the economy? Yeah, I, actually, I was on Bloomberg about six weeks ago, and I said that at that moment, I thought the worm was turning. And I really think that that was the key moment. You started to see hmm. uh, a surge in, in consumer sentiment in December that's carried forward into the data that we got today from the University of Michigan. The two month increase we've seen in the last two months is the highest we've seen since the 1990s. So we really do have a surge in consumer sentiment that I think is basically catching up to the other economic data that we've seen now for, for months and months, declining inflation, wages continuing to grow at a steady pace, job growth uh, continuing to power forward. And so I think sentiment is trying to catch up with the data. And if anything, the sentiment should continue to improve going into 2024. I mean, look at what we have on tap. We're likely to have several interest rate cuts, which will reduce the cost of getting a mortgage, reduce the cost of credit cards and so on. Uh, you should have continued job growth and you should have more, uh, more and more months of uh, inflation that's basically at or near the Fed's 2% target, which means inflation will be less salient than it was before. Uh, I would project that, that the sentiment will continue to increase as we get closer to the election. Spending time with Bharat Ramamurti today on Bloomberg Sound On. I know you didn't work for the communication shop in the White House, Bharat, but I wonder uh, what you make of the pitch, Bidenomics, the president getting back on the road is in Raleigh this week, making the case he'll continue to do that, I'm sure, throughout the campaign. But this is, uh, this is a moving target sometimes. You're updating, you're refining that pitch, and I wonder to what extent you would want to put a finer point on what Bidenomics is so it can begin connecting with people and show up in the polls. Yeah, at its core, really, Bidenomics is about uh, evaluating the economy based on the, the well-being of your typical middle class family. I think what the president has consistently cared about in his time in office and frankly for decades before that is, is your typical middle class family doing well? Uh, are, are people who are on the lower end of the income scale getting a chance to, to climb the ladder into the middle class and what kind of financial security are we providing for middle class families? I think that that uh, un underlies the type of response uh, he, mm -hmm. he brought to the pandemic in 2021 with the American Rescue Plan. That's at the heart of his Made in America agenda and trying to bring back manufacturing jobs. And that's at the, head of his, at, at the heart of his regulatory agenda. And I think if you look at the data, which is starting to get stronger at, with each passing day, you see that wealth uh, for the typical family has gone up 37% since the beginning of the pandemic. You see that wages adjusted for inflation have gone up quite a bit since the beginning of the pandemic. You see that job satisfaction is at its highest level in 36 years. So the, the president had a clear uh, agenda, which was to deliver gains to your typical household in the United States. And I think that even though we've, mm -hmm. we've come through a global inflation surge, uh, he has delivered that. Uh, and, and it's worth noting that a lot of other countries have it, and that whether it's the United Kingdom or the EU or Japan, those countries are, are limping while the United States is running ahead. Mm -hmm. Barat, it's interesting you to talk about how wealth has gone up, because obviously a lot of wealth is centered in, in home ownership on the one hand, but also in financial investments. And we're talking to you on a day where the S&P 500 has reached an intraday record high. The stock market has been on fire, but unlike his predecessor, former President Donald Trump, Biden doesn't really seem to want to talk about that much. Should he be doing it more? Hmm. It's not really the president's style. I mean, I think it's worth remembering that about 50% uh, of American households don't have any exposure to the stock market whatsoever. And so what the stock market is, it's an important economic metric, one of many, but it's really a metric that applies to the top half of Americans. And so the president's always going to be more focused on, you know, what percentage of people are unemployed, what are wages doing at the lower end of the spectrum and the middle end of the spectrum. 
And uh, and I think on all those metrics, we're seeing really strong performance. I do think it helps with overall economic sentiment, economic news coverage to see uh, stock market gains. In, in many ways, it is the economic indicator that gets the most amount of coverage. Now, there are other data points come out on a monthly or quarterly basis. Uh, there's stock market data every hour, every day. And so I think when you have good news in the stock market, it tends to drive better overall economic news coverage, and that will end up benefiting the president. But it's not the focus of his of, of his policies. What's the uh, the campaign look like then in delivering that message? Is it more in person, Barat? I know you're not a campaign strategist, but what would you want to see? You were you had your fingerprints on on this policy, and I wonder what the most effective way to bring that forth is. Is it is it the president himself speaking? Is it uh, more folks on Capitol Hill or something I'm not thinking of? Maybe you can enlist Hollywood here. Yeah, I mean, look, the, the most effective spokesperson for the president's policies is the president. And uh, what, what, I have all, what I've seen over the last three years when I was working in the White House is that when the president is out there interacting with voters in a, uh, in a more informal way and is able to talk through his rationale for why he did the things he did, why, when he's able to take on concerns from voters and explain why he thinks things are going to get better, I think really that's when he's at his best. So uh, uh, as you said, I'm not uh, in a position to tell the campaign what to do. But if, if I were, I would tell them that you know, trying to get the president out there to do these kinds of events uh, will be beneficial because uh, he's a likable, relatable guy who really cares very deeply about the well-being of a typical American. And, and that'll shine through the more you get to see him. And another thing that maybe separates his style from the former president's style is he has been very reluctant to weigh in on the policy of the Federal Reserve. Barat, just a final minute with you. We have seen after the data today the odds of a March cut from the Fed going down, at least in terms of how it's priced by the market. Do you think it would be a mistake for the Fed not to cut rates at that point? Well, I guess I would say I think the data leans in favor of the Fed starting to cut in March. I think it's a close call, but I think that that's what the data uh, suggest in part because uh, the CPI and other inflation data that we have now is a little bit out of date. It it, it doesn't reflect fully the the housing disinflation that's in the pipeline and that we know is coming. Uh, and so I think that if the Fed is going to do several cuts over the course of 2024, which is what they're predicting, that it makes sense for them to get started in March. Um, that said, you're right. The president ha really respects the independence of the Fed. He wants them to be data driven. He wants to. He has appointed people there that he that he trusts to interpret the data, uh, and to and to make the decisions that they're going to make based on that data. And that's not going to change going forward. Yeah. And I think by the way that that president's approach on that has been vindicated. He he stood back and let the Fed do what it needed to do. Do its work. And now look where we are. All right, Barat, we got to leave it there. Thank you so much for joining us today. That's Barat Ramamurti, former uh, deputy director of the National Economic Council, now at the American Economic Liberties Project. This is Bloomberg. You're listening to the Bloomberg Balance of Power podcast. Catch us live weekdays at noon Eastern on Apple CarPlay and Android Auto with the Bloomberg Business app. You can also listen live on Amazon Alexa from our flagship New York station. Just say, Alexa, play Bloomberg 1130. On the eve, I guess we can say, of the New Hampshire primary. Obviously, that'll be Monday, but it's the eve before we all delve into the but final the eve weekend of here. our trip to new hampshire that because we're true. gonna try to get there tomorrow and it's the final weekend this is like closing argument time which is a big deal if you're named nikki haley because boy this news today that senator tim scott is going to endorse donald trump tonight just made this a little bit harder for her to pull off yeah pretty remarkable to see this news of course she hasn't gotten that many endorsements mm -hmm. so far in this race she did get the very critical endorsement of the governor of new hampshire chris sununu yeah. but hasn't gotten that many congressional endorsements and obviously tim scott not going to be counted among those as he throws his hat in the ring for trump despite the fact that nikki haley is the one who nominated him to the senate in the first place pretty incredible um and as we get ready to get on the ground in manchester we're bringing a lot of voices from that part of the country who understand politics there, uh, beyond Rick Davis, of course, who has a way with New Hampshire. But when we get into the geography, the demographics, there's just something unique about New Hampshire, the role that independents play. Mm -hmm. And we wanted to uh, bring in Colin Reed uh, for part of that conversation today. He used to work for Senator Scott Brown, in fact, was campaign manager uh, for uh, Scott Brown in New Hampshire, described, as I read, by a leading pollster as the best campaign in the country. That's not bad. You know what else they say about Colin Reed? He's been on this program before. Uh, a veteran, this is The Hill, 
of the oppo research wars that have helped define presidential races. So, Colin, we're going to get more oppo on Nikki Haley this weekend. What are we in for here in the last couple of days of the campaign? Well, first of all, it's it's great to be with you both, and I'm jealous that you'll be traveling up there tomorrow. And you're right, we are. We're in that closing final stage. Voters are less. It's less about being persuaded at this point than it is about the various candidates and campaigns, making sure they get their people out to the polls in what has very, very quickly become a two person race between uh, former President Trump and Governor Haley. And to think that after the 2016 Republican primary, when there were so many people on that stage, they had to have multiple debates. And even earlier in, in this in this campaign, when there was eight, nine qualified people uh, to get down to two, it's it's a pretty remarkable thing. And it allows both campaigns to really have a, a clean shot at the other. So we're in that final stretch and it's it's an exciting time for sure. Yeah. And in this final stretch, Nikki Haley remains, at least in the latest polls we're seeing, there's been a few outliers, but behind Trump by a significant margin. And she's not debating in New Hampshire as we maybe thought she would be just about a week ago before we got the result from Iowa. So how hard is it in these final days to actually make a dent, improve her numbers, if she's not doing it on that kind of platform? Well, Governor Haley has run a quintessential New Hampshire campaign from start to finish. She's done the town hall meeting. She's been up there. She's been grinding it out. And she and her team placed an emphasis in the state early on. And it makes sense because 40% of the state's electorate don't belong to either political party. And those independents can vote in the in the Republican primary. And frankly, why wouldn't they? Because there's not a whole lot going on on the Democratic side. In fact, Democratic president can't even be bothered to put his name on the ballot. So if you're an independent, the Republican game is the entire uh, show in town. Now, as it relates to the final stretch, President Trump, we haven't been in this situation since 1892. And we've had a non incumbent essentially running as an incumbent and that was grover cleveland back then things have changed a lot since then and president trump for everything all the challenges he faces in the in the court of legal and public opinion he still is by and large the sitting incumbent president and in iowa he won with 50 percent of the vote that means about half the people voted for somebody else and if you're an incumbent president and you're only getting half the vote uh that's not necessarily a place you want to be so uh nikki haley's got her work cut out for her no doubt uh, it looks like consistently across the board, the polls have her across the board. The polls have her a few points down, but she's closing hard. She's closing strong, and uh, she's got a message tailor made for that independent-minded uh, New Hampshire electorate. Sure, seems like Donald Trump is going to be hard to catch, though. Here, what's the path, Colin? If Nikki Haley even wins New Hampshire, where do we go from here? Donald Trump is topping her by. 50 to 25 or some ridiculous spread in her home state of South Carolina. How much of a gift would even a win be in New Hampshire? Yeah, well, the the, the thing with New Hampshire is it'll allow uh, Ambassador Haley to move on. Uh, it, it'll allow the race to continue. Governor DeSantis isn't really competing in New Hampshire for all intents and purposes. So he's just he's placed all his marbles in the in the South Carolina bucket. And then, look, it's it's going to be a challenge, no doubt. The one thing I'd say the Haley camp has going for them is that a lot of these primaries, you look towards Super Tuesday, I believe it's of the 14 states that are voting, nine of them uh, have an, an, an independent, they're not a closed primary, meaning independents can vote. And again, if you're an independent-minded voter, if you're unenrolled in either political party, we know poll after poll after poll tells us that Americans, by and large, are extremely unhappy with the idea of a Joe Biden versus Donald Trump uh, repeat. And I think you're starting to see that in Ambassador Haley's messaging these last few days. She's starting to take more shots directly at uh, former President yep. Trump. And uh, there's only one way to get to get by him, and that's to go through him. So uh, she she's, mm -hmm. seems like she's reached that conclusion, and we'll see if it's enough to, to get her uh, to where she needs to go coming out of Tuesday. Yeah, but Colin, did she reach that conclusion too late? We're a pretty far away into this thing, and that's not the song she's been singing this entire time. Yeah, and we'll find out. Uh, look, I think the, the critique she's made on, on both of them as being kind of elderly, past their prom, over the hill uh, candidates is one that, that's resonant, especially beyond just the hardened Republican base, which is by and large going to be with Trump. So, you know, it, but at the same time, it's, it's almost the impossible riddle because the former president does enjoy such high favorable ratings amongst hardline voters 
uh, Politics 101, you don't want to be saying negative things about a person that is viewed very favorably. So we'll find out. And that'll be the that'll be there'll be plenty of ink spilled on that on Wednesday morning. Um, but I think the, the way she's been able to offer Republicans a different path forward. Uh, again, there's a, there's a, New Hampshire is just tailor made for her because there's a lot of people up there really unhappy with the way things are going. Really don't like Joe Biden. Joe Biden is not someone who's ever done well in New Hampshire throughout his three runs for office. He, he left the state early in 2020. He just got blown out so badly. So uh, and we've seen it before. So New Hampshire's delivered surprises in, in, in before. And, and, and I wouldn't count uh, Governor Haley out. But, yeah, that, that being said, President Trump is a is a political force for sure. Colin, uh, let's go to ground in our remaining uh, moment or two here. What will you be watching? You know New Hampshire. What will you be watching on Tuesday night? Will it be those conservative suburbs along the Massachusetts border? Or are you going to wait to see what happens in the rural areas that might help to turn this into Nikki Haley's favor? The, the, the entire ball game in terms of population is right on the mass border, or at least in that Boston yeah. media market. Like Seven in ten voters get their news from Boston and that's where it's going to be. And these are people who are, a lot of them commute down to Boston. Uh, a lot of them live in New Hampshire because they don't like the high taxation states of, of some of the neighboring states. And these are people who really don't like the Biden policies, probably didn't really love the Trump policies. And these are the people who uh, are, are, are who Nikki Haley needs to come out and vote for. And look, it's a small state. This is why these small states matter, because between the next 96 hours or however much time until the polls close, there's a pretty good chance that if you work it hard enough, you can meet a lot of these people up close and personal at a market basket, at a Dunkin' Donuts, you name it. And uh, these, these candidates break, these, these, these voters tend to break late and break hard. And uh, Governor Haley's got a lot of, got some time between now and Tuesday to kind of make the case uh, and get them out because uh, after this, New Hampshire, it's it's yeah. it's uh, it, it gets awfully late early in terms of this primary process. All right, Colin Reed, South and Hill Strategies co-founder and Republican strategist. Thank you so much for joining us. And of course, Joe, the other thing we have to consider about New Hampshire is maybe what turnout's going to look like, considering it is not going to be the historic <laughs> wind chills we saw yes. in Ooh, Iowa. Be and because normal. it's a primary, people can show up and vote throughout the day versus having to be at a certain mm -hmm. location right at a certain time in order True. to participate. It's also considered, you know, sport in New Hampshire. Like they, everyone's <laughs> like, you'll have guys with like no shirt on and makeup like they're going to a football game. Oh, going to, it's well, like that. that'll be the Trump rally, not going to vote. <laughs> Um, we'll find out at some polling areas, but you know, you'll see the guy like the Trump impersonators and the, yeah. the orange jumpsuits walking on Elm street. Um, it does seem to be something that the people want to be involved in. And to your point, it's going to be 40 degrees on primary day. That's shorts weather up there. Yeah. You're bringing your shorts, right? I should. You're listening to the Bloomberg balance of power podcast. Catch us live weekdays at noon Eastern on Apple CarPlay and Android Auto with the Bloomberg Business app. Listen on demand wherever you get your podcasts or watch us live on YouTube. Some pretty cool stuff going on uh, in the next couple of days, not just the New yeah. Hampshire primary, but on this very program, Kaylee, this right here, look at this with our loyal viewers and listeners on the radio and YouTube, the final two minutes ever of Sound On on Bloomberg. Yes. As sound on. We We're did not, not going away. We did not get fired. <laughs> there is still time for that. Um, but we're going to be going to an earlier time slot. Yeah. 12 noon to 2 p.m. Washington time. And it's going to be called Balance of Power as we expand the franchise from TV here uh, to sound on. And this is going to be a, kind of our vehicle to cover an incredible and historic campaign season but starting on monday a little bit of a different look a different time mm -hmm. our second hour will be on television when you grace us with your presence and it's all up from here right yeah i'm, How did I'm I do with super that? excited that was Excellent. perfect thank you i feel like we should probably also you know tweet this out so people get their times locked we shall we'll follow up on social media with that uh but yes when you find us on monday we're going to be in manchester yep and it's going to be pretty wild up there we'll start at noon time manchester time uh, and we'll go through 2 p.m our colleagues at Bloomberg Business Week will follow us as well mm -hmm. with uh, with their hour. That's going to be on Bloomberg TV. And, uh, you know, it's going to be something to experience together. I'm just delighted that you're going to be along for the ride. Uh -huh. We get to do this on TV, on Balance of Power, which will also be now shared on the radio. Yep. So we're pure play, baby. Isn't that what they call it in the business? <laughs> two so. hours yeah. of Kaylee and Joe every day. Just what everyone. One to two, five to six. I really Bloomberg feel TV like they need that. And yeah. radio. 
I'm excited. We no, have I fun am too. Here. This is fantastic. I started here a few years ago doing this one hour of political radio in the afternoon, sort of randomly th happening on Bloomberg. Now, of course, we're in the throes of 2024, and it's That's very right. important to us here at Bloomberg TV and radio, and we're going to share our resources here on the satellite, on the radio, on YouTube, and on Bloomberg TV. And boy, we're going to experience a lot together in the next couple of months. And there's no better place for a debut than Manchester, New Hampshire. Yes, Hampshire. exactly. Zero to 100, Joe. <laughs> Hard go. launch. Here what we go. What could go wrong? <laughs> hey, Carol and Tim, we'll meet you on Monday. I'm Joe Matthew, along with Kaylee Lines in Washington. Don't forget to shovel. I'll meet you in Manchester. Sounds good.